John Mellencamp the script one day, and um, he came up with half the music. So the and then Leon Redbone recorded the that signature song, so that the cast could sing it throughout the film. And then when I finally showed him the movie, the band put the the rest of the soundtrack together in about 36 hours. Amazing. That's, amazing. That's true talent. Very true talent. The whole movie is favors. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, I was gonna say, why do I feel like Tom Hanks? Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of Tom Hanks, yeah. that must have been fun. Since it was great. Reunite with Tom. Yeah, great. He's yeah, he's just incredible. He came. Uh, he he worked for one day, and um, at the end of his day, <laughs> he gathered the crew together and he said, "Well, I know we've gotten to know each other really well in the last ten hours." <laughs> But thank you for being here for my friend Meg, and um, you know helping her for this first experience. So he just flew in and sat in his little honey wagon, which is like a tin can, <laughs> all day and did whatever I asked. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I guess the first question I have was: Was this fun for you? Was this fun? Because I know other directors, you know, say it's like it's it's a job, it's a process, but. It seems like you had fun doing this. Yes. I mean, the best, uh, really the best part, which is, you know, I've done something like, I don't know, 37 movies, but I never knew what everybody else was doing. Right. right. <laughs> I just did it, and I was so involved with myself. But, um, so this was it's a great... Bad. It's not <laughs> bad. Don't feel guilty. I mean, I kind of knew. But this was great because you're whispering around with these incredible people. Andrew Dunn, who is a cinematographer. Yes, wonderful. He, all of a sudden, you're looking at light in a whole new way. Or you talk to Ron Bokar, who was our sound engineer, and he gets to talk to you about what really makes silence. No, not just plain silence. You put in a little sound of a bug, and then it sounds even more silent. And then you get to whisper with John Mellencamp or Sam Shepard or my son. My son's in the film. He plays Marcus. Excellent. And, um, yeah. So it was great to, to hear his process too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All these artists come right. together in this right. art form, and, and that's what's fun. Right. So I think most people know that the movie was inspired based on this wonderful, well known book, this Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Human Comedy, written in 1943, so a while ago. He, William Soroyan wrote it originally as a screenplay. And Louis B. Mayer promised him that he could direct it. Then he turned in a 225-page <laughs> screenplay, which is about double the size of a, yeah, as that's long a three-hour movie, right. right? And so Mayer said, "Forget it." And so Soroyan stomped off and novelized it, and ultimately won an Academy Award for Best um, Story. Wow! Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, because it was made obviously. Yeah, Mickey. Uh, movie. Right. Mm -hmm. So. But what was important about the story, the book, for you? Why, why this? I mean, you could have chosen a lot of books. You could have chosen the script of anywhere. Why was this important for your first film? Well, for, for me, it's a simple story about very complicated things. And I thought that that would have a filmic equivalent, given my, my inexperience, that we could tell this story simply because the story was so strong. Um, and at the time, when I read the book, I read it much later than most people come to it, but I had just gone through a divorce, and my, um, and I remember it was like the run-up to the Iraq War, and the world felt very unsafe. And when I read the book, Soroyan is so deeply an optimist, and he so trusts the idea of community, and he wrote a story about transcending tragedy, that community is what helps you do that. And in the book, there's just so many wonderful passages, and I was moved by it, you know. And this was such a, such a simple story, these three telegrams that this boy delivers, and he becomes a man in the process. Well, comedy's hard. <laughs> um, and I, I think what, 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 why I'm lucky is you have to have your head down for so long and pay so much attention for so long when you're a director and for an actor I'm in and out in three months but these these ideas are, are interesting to me you know the idea that no one there's everyone in the main characters in this film have to say yes to all things they have to say yes to something they don't want that's a sustaining that was sustaining my attention and 
I love being a mother, and I, um, this is a story, the book was dedicated to Saroyan's mother, and I felt also that, that that's my, that's what I'm most familiar with, frankly, and that's the position I took as a filmmaker, and um, I know that better than romantic comedy, so that's the answer. <laughs> Well, it's terrible, Shana. <laughs> Thank you. <But laughs> you were tough on yourself. Right? No, it's horrible. I mean, the la I don't want to blow it for people, but that last part where, you know, she has to accept the fact that this one son needs to complete this task to become a man by delivering this news about her other son. It's impossible, but I'm thinking, why is that crane moving so slowly? <laughs> it's really too slow. I've got to say something. This is terrible. You know, I mean, yeah, it was such a split experience. You have to be as an actor so subjective and as a director so objective it's very hard i'll never do it again interesting well he walked in to yeah, our yeah she oh. she would like to know about the actor the, the little actor who played ulysses the young actor he walked in as a joke his parents are, are like work at the I don't want to get this wrong, like the space pro propulsion laboratory or something. And he came in as, on a complete lark, and he is such an, he's such a, beyond a natural, and very shortly I learned to say nothing, because it would ruin whatever instinct that he had, which was always great. He really wanted to be good. He, and he, I would say, watch James Dean, look at these movies, read this book. He would do everything and come back and and kind of report about it. It was so important to him. He was so moving, and I think for the crew to watch this boy who really was in this 23-day shoot that we had, he became different by the end. You know, the very last scene for him is the very last thing we shot with him, him coming up the, and there's a little jog up of the camera which where you really see that he's looking down at his mom. He's grown that much. We all felt that about him. So really fortunate to find somebody that serious and that emotional and he moved me too because he would come up to me not look at me for direction he'd come up and stand and kind of lean down and just put his ear <laughs> like this so I could give him a little yeah. insight into yeah. something or whatever he needed he's a very dear person and I like fell in love with him in a serious way. And when we were cutting the movie, I had him, you know, sometimes the editor on those down days, he just put <laughs> little Ulysses' face up on the screen so I could just look at it. And then he became my screensaver. And then he came to New York with his mom to visit me for lunch one day. And um, he was five years old at the time. So it's a couple months later. And I realized halfway through the lunch, he didn't remember who I was. <laughs> <laughs> Go. Yeah, and on the set, you know, he realized I like to do like three takes. That's ultimately what I like, three or four takes. And so he, but got so savvy that about halfway through the movie, he had this one line where he says, "Homer's going to work." And he goes, "Homer's going to work. Homer's going to work. Homer's going to work." <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Right. So all the kids were great. Well, it's interesting. A couple of nights ago, we had another young director here who directed three young boys in a movie called Yosemite, and she was given a piece of advice about working with actors, working with children actors, and, and I think it was from Iris Sack, who's a well-known uh, director in New York, who said, never say action when you're directing children. What I'm leading to is, did you get any advice, or did you seek out any advice from directors you maybe have worked with? Uh, well, yes, I did, in general. But for the book, the kids, I read what, about what Hal Roach did with the Little Rascals. Oh, yeah. Which is basically give them very little information, mm -hmm. and then always a sense of play. And then they're not acting. They're the most natural actors ever. You just don't want to get in the way. And, um, and they believe. They just believe, you know? He believed. He, a little piece of him running at the very beginning. I wish that I could watch it over and over again on a loop, which I have. <laughs> I just think he's so adorable. But that was it. I um, Hal Roach gave them very. He kept a sense of play, and um, sometimes would shout lines at them, and they would just repeat like that. But you just, if you kept it fun, and we tried to do that for them, they they didn't get actory. Yeah. Right. Were there any other things that you were given advice to for as a first-time director, or were there anything that was given to you and you said, no, that's not me, that's not going to work with me? 
Well, I thought a lot about how I like to work, and another one of the great things about being a director is that you know every actor works differently. So Sam worked very differently than Hamish, worked very differently than me, and most of the people in the film had never been in a film before. <laughs> um, man, I don't remember your question. What was it? But oh, so what I like, and I Brad Silverling is here, who yes. I had worked with as a director, and what. I like is when we have secrets, and that's what worked with all the, everybody. Like I like I whisper something to Sam, which was he is a disappointment. This Mr. Spangler is a disappointment. When you go over to whisper to Hamish, playing Spangler, you can't get his approval. There's nothing you could. So you take all the sides, but you're whispering the whole time, and it's so fun that kind of confederacy, right? Wow. Yeah, that's great. That's great insight. Uh, you asked how working as a director impacts your work as an actor. And I think profoundly, I, especially in the editing room, I learned it, it's just not important to do things right. It's just not important. It's important to live fully in a moment. And if you're on your mark, great. If you're not, hopefully the, the crew is expert enough to catch it because you want things that are alive. and. I'm I'm a very prepared person. I do a lot of intellectualizing about things, and that almost doesn't have a place, in, you know, frankly, or it has a different type of place than I had given it a different value. Well, that really happens because you're so tired <laughs> that you just think, oh, it's one less person to worry about, and then you then you're there doing it, and you think it's the dumbest thing you've ever thought of. <laughs> Truth. Yeah. Did, yeah. did you consult anyone on that subject? Other directors who had put themselves into well, a movie? I, I work with such incredible people, and so, and all of them are willing to, you know, get me in the union, um, uh, <laughs> the DGA, um, all kinds of things. But but Jane Campion gave me great advice, and, and I, which I every minute used, which was when, when the moment comes, when the scene is really going, and you're sitting by the monitor, you're watching your actors, really, that's when you need to be an artist and be an emotional conduit. What you know as an actor, use it then, because then you can tell the truth about what's happening, because everything See, is fairly predictable on a movie. Usually two plus two equals four. The light is going to go there, and the sound is going to be like that, weather is going to be changing. But the actors are mysterious even to themselves. And um, on my set, and most sets I've ever been on, that, that's been given a lot of respect. And you know, Nora Ephron threw a party every time. I mean, she, I thought about her quite a bit too because she, she made it fun to be there. And easy and smart. She was always, she, she never, no, no one I've ever worked with was really a, 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 a like a tyrant or anything like that. But she was in, she used her femininity in such an intelligent way that that was something nice to, a reference that I had too. Well, speaking of scenes, I think you mentioned scenes. Do you have a favorite scene in the movie? That's something that just you just keep coming back to. Now you kind of alluded to the little boy in the beginning running. Uh, is there any other special scenes that you really loved? Well, oh, I love so many, but I love him putting his hands up to the rain, little Ulysses, and I, I loved um, so much of Marcus's voiceover that was found in the end, and that we, we found a lot of that from the book. You know, that character had to be defined by what he, the, the gifts of wisdom that he gave his brother. But I love Sam walking out, uh, um, Grogan walking out of the, office in the night and looking up the street at what he's just sent this boy to do. And I very much love Homer's, um, he's, he's alone like in a spotlight, and he says, I just want things to be better. And that moved me so much. To me, that's the heart of the movie. Somebody who wants this impossible thing to keep the angel of death away from the people he loves and to just make everything better. And right now I feel like I'm glad this little movie is going to make its little way out into the world and say it. It's like a little poem on a postcard, I think, this film. And I'm happy it's making its way out now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, um, that's a 
That's a, quite a process. And in, in this case, we found, you know, the difficult thing actually about the book and this narrative is that um, this narrative is always telling you what's going to happen. So you're, you always know kind of what's going to happen. I mean, we have songs even in the movie, When I Get to Heaven. I mean, there's all this pointing toward the inevitable. And teasing the poetry out of that was the real effort in the editing room. But the we changed the end, by the way. We changed the end of the book. It's a very different ending, but we, we I felt that this was the stronger dramatic ending, and so we took that license. the young man who played Homer. You have some great scenes with him, very sensitive and tender scenes. Um, and he's obviously quite young. I, I don't really know how old he really is. But just could you address him a little bit? He he is from Kansas City. He'd been in LA for maybe four or five months. He'd done a little teeny part in a horror movie. And he he was trying to he's trying to decide he was fifteen, he turned sixteen on the day we wrapped. And he was like this perfect autumn day, you know, you look this way and it's summer and you look this way and it's fall and he, his voice was changed. I mean, yeah. Well, you mentioned the shots and, and many times in the movie when I was watching it, um, you know, it was like a photographic shot, you know, it was like a photographer's eye capturing that moment. And I believe you are a photographer. And so how um, involved were you with the cinematographer, you know, lining up shots? It's the, the greatest thing. I mean, we shot listed everything, but then finding it, you know, that, that was such a, that's such a deep pleasure of mine to go around uh, a set and figure out what the pictures are. And we, we looked a lot at the American realist painters and right. photographers, and um, we had a real design about what happened in the telegraph office. And you started out with all those wide lenses and the big lights, and it, and it just telescoped down and down and down into a pool of light uh, around these two this man passing this wisdom on to this boy. Mm -hmm. And that was all a design and it's so fun. It's yeah. so fun to do that. Yeah. That was just another gift of this whole thing that, you know, he we were lucky to get him because he'd just come from Martin Scorsese's set. <laughs> he was doing vinyl. He oh, wow. shot the pilot of vinyl, which is a seventies sort of rock and roll piece. Right. And then he came took the train down to Virginia and shot with us. But you know He's a real worker. He, you know, he's put in his ten thousand hours by the time he was like eleven. I mean, he he'd be making movies with his friends at my house, and they'd all come out of one door and the other dressed as you know, like a movie is like cereal box superheroes, and someone is the tricks Easter bunny, the tricks bunny, and Captain Crunch, and they're fighting, and and then it was this natural thing. All of a sudden, we were on a set, and there's a real AD and real costumes and it didn't feel much different than what uh, the kind of sense of play that he, he and I have always had together but he's such a pro it was, it was so fun I think he's beautiful in the movie about the kids the young boys you see often in the movie in and out of the movie dressed up uh, it kind of reminded me of kind of a Peter Pan thing going on there like these boys kind yeah. of they were the sprites sense. right yeah. they they were always to me they really weren't in the script they were so, they were kids i kept around because i felt like they were the measure of homer always had from his own right. innocence and the loss of it and the, and and i love that i think that says so much about the period that the kids just ran so wildly all over the town i love yes. it yes this became much much more um much less verbal, and and I think what, what what I really like about the film and what I ended up pretty much cultivating in the uh, editing room was the spareness of everything, the simpleness of the music, the simplicity of the words. You know, you, it, there's a maxim in filmmaking which is show don't tell, and the pictures did so much work that we didn't need that the dialogue became not necessary and the actors, you know, it was the actors, it's the simplicity of the story, it's the light and it's the music. And 23 days. And It's magic, as you said. It's just magic. And, and that element of acting, you know, that's the real sort of unknown of what you're going to get. And, and right. hope and of any directors to bring it all together. The, and it was really... The other truth is that there were so so many of the kids are kids I know, and they're friends of people I've met on the vineyard, that, <laughs> and the boys, those three soldiers who are so adorable, 
they are are in a comedy troupe with my son Jack. They have this troupe called Sasquatch, and so I knew most. It of was the like people. a family affair. I mean, yeah. At which makes perfect sense on your first outing. Yeah. So, can we can we maybe get a little knowledge of your next project? Because I read that you are going to be doing something new. Maybe you yeah, can yeah. Inform I mean, us we'll see what happens, yeah. but um, uh, yeah, is it like does it jinx it? <laughs> no? Well, we're supposedly, right now, Working Titles hired um, Delia Efron to write a romantic comedy that I'll direct about the publishing world. So, romantic comedy, here I come. There you go. There you go. And, but you're not going to be in it. No. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent job. Thank you all so much. So can we show every movie you do here? Richard, please. And thank you again for this favor, because I know you don't normally, but it's it really means a lot to me to be here. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you.